Welcome back, everyone, to the Unconventional Money Moves podcast. I have former basketball star Idris Aurafai with us today. He is the CEO of Fetcher and Flow 48. And essentially, he is in the, he's like the mailman. He's like Carl Malone, but in the business world, uh, helping International Express and things like that. So happy to have Idris on. Uh, and I was looking for some basketball highlights or like your your basketball career, like, what was that like? Where were you playing? Uh, yeah, no, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I used to play actually for, uh, so I was playing in like, like next to Toulouse for a bit. And then I was playing uh, for Paris, actually, in what we call Espoir, which is basically like the young team of uh, Paris. Uh, yeah, that was fun. That was fun. What, when when were you playing? Like, what, what was, uh, so what was the... For, yeah, I'm old now, 2000... 99 to 2002. That's probably okay. You're, so did you ever like get to play against like any NBA players or anything like that? Like who was the most notable person you went up against? Yeah, we did. Uh, I think so. the, the one that I really, um, that I remember was uh, Baron Davis. I don't know if you remember back then. Uh, he was coming back from, uh, from surgery. And I remember like uh, there was a lot of like players where, you know, I just like feel like there is quite a lot of talent and explosivity. But this guy was a whole other level. Um, so that was one we played against Kirilenko back in the days as well. I don't know if you remember. Uh, yeah, was, Andre uh, Kirilenko. He was a defensive player of the year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He was like seven footer, like a little bit like the modern, um, like number three, right? He was a small forward, I think, back then. Uh, but he was like seven foot, seven three, you know, uh, wingspan. It was like a bit of uh, the beginning of the modern uh, day players, it feels like. Yeah, that's super cool. And I mean, it's like, it's crazy when you even you get to the professional level. Like there's still someone who's like a little, <laughs> there's a little bit better. Oh yeah, no, for uh, sure, for sure. You know, this is what, you know, like I was, I was working a lot, you know, I was working my ass off trying to make it work. But you know, like at some point, talent is just, you can see raw talent when you see it. Um, and whether it's explosion or, um, you know, like just the, like the mere physicality of it. It's just like, it's, it's just difficult to beat it. And I think I'm nothing amazing, you know? So when I always make fun of myself, you know, when I say like, uh, you know, I said, okay, what were you, what you used to do well? It's like, yeah, my assist to turnover ratio was great. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, nobody cares about that except, you know, you know, people who know the game, but yeah, it was just, it was a different time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I remember I met uh, Charlie Ward one time and he played for the New York Knicks and he said, his favorite moment as an NBA player is when he got dunked on by Michael Jordan. <laughs> He's like, how many people could say they actually got dunked on by Michael Jordan? He's like, I can. Uh, so it was kind of funny about that. And what I find interesting about what you're saying is you obviously had physical gifts, being able to play a professional sport at a high level. And then you realized, you know, the body can only take you so far. So you transferred what you learned in t terms of discipline and work ethic and then realized your mind has unlimited potentials and helped you translate to a entrepreneurial adventure yeah no clearly clearly yeah i fully agree i think what you get from from uh i think like uh you know being like professional or being very committed to the sport is one the structure to the feeling that you know like nothing comes without pain you know, like you have to be, uh, you have to go through the hurdles, you have to go through the pain if you want to be able to uh, uh, to get better. So it's something that I learned, um, you know, quite early. And then when I joined the Special Forces, uh, you know, it was that, but times 10, I had to go through like a lot. And then obviously like entrepreneurship is slightly different, but, um, you know, similar version of it, I would say, at least for me, yeah. So you joined the Special Forces after, after basketball? After, I mean, yeah, a few years after, yeah, three years after. Oh, what I mean, was in, in, what were you doing there? Um, so typical, right? So typical, like uh, very similar to the Navy SEALs uh, in the US. Uh, so typical uh, behind enemy lines uh, stuff, uh, which was it's big word for just to say, like, just to understand what the hell is going on. In some of the part of the words, we had like very conflicting opinions about what's going on. I don't know if you remember, but, you know, back then, like in Central African Republic, Sudan, Chad, and even in Somalia, like some people said, like we had like very, very conflicting views on what, um, you know, how the situation was. 
So typically, um, either the EU or France sends missions there that they call like fact-finding missions, and they need to be run by uh, special forces because you have no support whatsoever. Uh, you're literally, you know, in the middle of the, you know, middle of nowhere with like three, four, five, six people, sometimes twenty. No, uh, no logistics whatsoever. So you have to be able to, uh, to survive and and get by. So yeah, I did that for a couple of years. What what made you decide to do that? Um, so I wouldn't say that it was my dream forever, you know, like I, it's just like I, I got into it and, and I, I think I was missing some of that. So obviously there is like this, uh, discipline aspect, but it's not like, well, usually when we talk about army, we think about infantry, right? We all have this movie, like full metal jacket and that kind of stuff. It's just like special forces are very different, right? It's a group of, I think it's very similar to what entrepreneurship is in a way. Because it's like it's a small group, like six people. Uh, everyone is very specialized in one thing, but as a group, like you're, you're, you can move mountains, right? You can actually do stuff that an infantry of like two hundred people cannot do, and we cannot do stuff that they can do. I'm not saying we're better, but you see what I mean? Like it's it's very different. It's very uh, research oriented. Like it has to work. Uh, there is a lot of that culture. Um, you know, uh, there is always this um, difference. You know that I. That I always keep in mind, you know, between the obligation of means and obligations of results uh, from Montesquieu and uh, like a French philosopher. And I think like in the special forces, it's an obligation of results. Like we do not care about how tough it is. It needs to work. You need to get the mission accomplished. Um, and I think, yeah, it's very similar to that. Making team, making sure that the team, the team chemistry is there, that everything is working correctly, that everyone is pulling in one direction. Very similar, if you see, in a way. So yeah, I loved it. I mean, one thing I've learned is you can't you can't do everything by yourself, even if yeah. you want to. So like being that you were in a team sport and then went over to the ar the the army, essentially, yeah. you're on essentially like the person next to you, the person behind you, the person in front of you, the person to the right of you is counting on you because if you make a mistake. It could be deadly. Yeah, and you count on them as well, right? It's that. Uh, that's one. Two. I think it's it's also like being surrounded by people that are better than you. I think it's it's kind of weird, but like you know, like it's a like I was the only officer and I was the least qualified. You see what I mean? Because like uh, I had people under me that were just doing this for like fifteen years, and I was here for only like one year, two years, and I was like, so don't pretend to be the boss. You just the uh, you know you just you just need. You just need to do your job properly and make sure that you know, like the that you take the input and that you make you know the decisions on the spot. But it's very, it's very, it's very clear that you know, like you're nothing without your team. And I think it's something that really stays with me. Um, and I think the chemistry between a team member, between team members, is just, I mean, it's second to none. I think is the most important thing in in anything in sports, in in the army, in and same in, in in business i think yeah and being that you were playing basketball at a high level you were in the uh, reserves at a high level yep uh, you learned the importance of teamwork and some people who are super high performers have trouble with that like i remember uh, magic johnson became the coach for the lakers and he was terrible at it because he was like telling people to do things and people were like, I can't do what you want me to do. Like, it's just yeah. not, it's not possible. And that's why I feel like people like such as yourself, uh, Steve Kerr is now having a lot of success as a coach because they understand how you can have great players, but without the team, yeah. they're just the team a great is a whole player. Different animal in and of itself. Yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. I love, and I love what Steve, like Steve Kerr is like talking about leadership and teamwork and that kind of stuff. It's exactly what it is. Yeah, fully agree. Right. And I'm just out of curiosity, like going from playing pro basketball to playing the army, like what does that do to like your ego? Like, was it like kind of like eye opening? Oh, was it humbling. like, like, did you like look, like find out like who you really were? Like, did you like, like, I, I'm interested to hear about that. Um, so, I mean, so for me, ego to get my ego blown up is quite difficult. I think like even more so like, because I think probably the biggest success was at some point when I was at Fetcher. And I think like, 
I, I, I think it's almost the opposite. I do not understand successful people who are not humble because you know what you've been through, so you cannot lie to other people that have been through the same, and you know that part of it has been luck. And it doesn't matter, right? And it's the same with sports, right? It, it's obviously there is all the discipline, the performance, the culture, uh, you doing all the sacrifices, but at some point there is luck too. Like you need to be at the right time at the at the right time at the right place. And it's crazy, like for example, like how many basketball players coming from university, you know, that have like so much talent and do not find the right fit in any other team. It has nothing to do with their talent, intrinsic talent. It's just that they're not exposed to the right people and their lives could have changed dramatically, right? So I think it's it's extremely like people who are not humble, like uh, there is really something that bugs me because it means that there is definitely a misunderstanding about how they got there. Um, and it doesn't, you know, I'm not saying obviously like everything is easy, like everything is tough, but the fact that it's tough and the discipline and everything is a prerequisite. It's not a recipe. Yeah. And if you're talented, things can be easy in the beginning. Like you could just have like, you pick up a golf club and you're like, you know, this is pretty easy. I have a naturally good swing, but eventually you hit a limit and that's where you find out who the people are willing to run through the wall are because talent can only take you so far. And yeah. with like starting your company, where did the concept, where did the idea come from? Like walk us through that. Yeah, sure. And you know, to go, going back on that, on that one, you know, how many number one of the drafts have been a, you know, a complete flop, right? So oh, they... literally best player of that year. You know, I look back at this video, you know, like from like 10 years, 15 years ago, you look at some of these draft picks, it's like, Man, this guy completely disappeared after one year, two years, right? Why? It's because the NBA is like 82 games. It's not 10 games, and like 20 games like in college or 15, 20, 30 games like in Europe. Like it's just, it's a, it's a job now. It's very demanding. You have to be very structured, very disciplined. It just, you just don't make it. Anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I mean, how, mu how much do you think money affects people? Like, because when money enters the equation, like your whole mindset yeah. can change. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It does. Yeah. It's part of it. It's part of it. Definitely. Especially, you know, if you look at the like the, the socioeconomic status where, you know, the people come from. So having a lot of money. And then if you look at the podcast, you know, there is a lot of people saying like, oh, shit, now I've got money. Like, it's just it was very weird uh, for them to uh, uh, to comprehend this. That's why actually 75 percent get broke after five years, uh, because it's just that they have they don't they, like they, they have problem with how they handle money and the relationship with money. Um, but yeah, 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 not completely. Gotcha. So let's, let's talk about like how this business started. Like where, where does this idea come from? Uh, flow, you mean flow 48? Yeah. Yeah. Flow, flow 48. Um, so look, when I was, uh, I would say two things, right? So there is a part of me that is like, um, that really realized that in, in, um, so in the Middle East, right, UAE and Saudi Arabia, but a lot of the other countries like follow very similar patterns across emerging markets. Um, is that banks uh, tend to distrust uh, SMEs. They do not have the tools to understand the SME risk, and therefore they do not lend them. So they do not lend it to them, right? So for example, in the UAE, um, so like, uh, which is Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and so on, like the seven Emirates, um, like SMEs represent about 50%, 55% of GDP, and only 6% of bank lending, right? And you have this problem across, you know, multiple geographies. The problem is somehow similar in the West, right? In Western Europe, in the US, a lot less. But uh, because the banking sectors are actually found tools and they have um, they have tools in their, you know, like at the, uh, at, the finger, uh, at the fingertips so that they can actually assess SMEs. In the, in the developing economy, we don't have that. And therefore, it's very um, scary to assess SME risk. And therefore, they just don't do it and they just don't land, which is a problem for job creation. We all understand that SMEs are the biggest job creators. Uh, we all understand that SMEs are, you know, literally the, the network, you know, uh, to build an economy, uh, especially as you're trying to diversify away from oil. So anyway, like based on both these things, there is a massive discrepancy between where SMEs should be at and where they're being financed. Uh, so that's a little bit the, you know, the gap we want to bridge by providing one, uh, the tools to understand how to assess the risk for SMEs, and then two, providing the facility. So we're raising debt, and we're deploying debt uh, to um, to SMEs. Gotcha, so like what kind of SMEs are you focusing on? So um, uh, we're sector agnostic, stage agnostic, 
as long as the company meets the financial criteria uh, that is required for us to be able to disperse, right? So, you know, being in emerging market is always a plus and a minus. There is some some things that are easier, some things that are a lot tougher uh, than in the US, especially. Uh, one of the things that is um, easier is the fact that there's very limited competition, right? So we don't have banks that do the job properly. We do not have like tons of, we do not have to specialize. For example, if you look at the US, the way RBF, uh, worked, um, you know, if you look at Pipe, but also like Wayflyer and so on, they're very specialized in one sector uh, because they need to, right? So that they understand better. So they have, an, they have an edge compared to both from a product perspective, but also from a credit risk assessment perspective. Uh, we don't have that because like we're, we're, it's a, we're selling water in the desert in a way. Uh, so we don't have that problem. But the problem that we have uh, is how to make sure that we have reliable uh, source of information. And for that, triangulation of information is super, super critical and therefore tech. Perfect. Like what is, um, what's like a sort of company you go in to, to assist with? Um, I know you said, you mentioned like trying to get away from like oil, because obviously oil is huge over yeah. that part of the part of the world. Look, we're we're financing like really any types of company. I would say what set us apart is one, the fact that we're really focusing on uh, um, like women-led businesses that represents about 60, 70 percent of the of the of the business. Because if you have a bias towards SMEs, you have an even more bias towards minority owned SMEs. Uh, so they have an even lower chance of getting funded. And obviously it's a market, it's a market um, you know, inefficiency, really. Uh, if you're um, so yeah, we I mean we're financing businesses that are you know uh, lawyers. We're financing uh, a meat manufacturer. Uh, we manuf we're financing uh, green two green energy company uh, solar panels. So yeah, it goes all over the place. Yeah, uh, we're financing a few restaurants as well. We found that working capital is a key issue for restaurants as they want to as they want to you know like uh, grow. So yeah, we're financing through platforms. And with that part of the world, like a lot of people know about it, but they don't know like what's going on. Like what, what exactly is happening in like Dubai other than like, I see like cool pictures, like these skyscrapers and like people driving million dollar cars. Like yeah. what, what is actually happening over there that like someone on in America isn't, isn't aware of? I think a lot. <laughs> I think uh, I would say uh, one, people tend to think that Dubai is the same as what was Saudi Arabia 20 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, which means like very conservative uh, with, uh, you know, uh, with limited rights for women and minorities. It's completely different. I think if you're obviously, so I lived a couple of years in the US, in Chicago, in LA, uh, I think the best example of Dubai, the thing that is probably it's a mix between New York and Vegas in a way for multiple reasons, because is that one, everyone is very driven uh, in in uh, in Dubai. Everybody works hard, uh, party hard, but also work hard. And the words of that, this influencer word is a tiny percentage uh, of what's happening in Dubai. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, this country was nothing. Like 50 years ago, you look at the picture of what was Dubai in the 80s. It's crazy. You have two towers and a, and a, and a road in the desert. So what Dubai has managed to achieve is second to none. It's completely incredible uh, what they've done. It And Dubai does not have oil, which is a huge misconception of what people uh, have about the Middle East, right? Dubai has been built purely on, on free trade. And uh, and it's not the case for Abu Dhabi, not the case for Saudi Arabia, but Dubai is very, it's very different. So, yeah, so I would say the biggest the biggest mis like misconceptions is that is that one, it's relying on oil, not, not at all for Dubai, uh, a bit less so for Abu Dhabi. Uh, to that, you know, uh, women rights completely wrong. Every like tons of women work in Dubai. Every, like uh, obviously, every woman drive. So it's completely yeah. It's very very westernized while still having the roots of the country, right? So, but yeah, I would say big misconceptions. I remember when I was in the US, I had quite a lot of discussions about those. Yeah. Yeah, kind of what you're what you're saying kind of reminds me of like Austin, Texas. Yeah. a little bit yeah like austin's been very up and coming and a lot of companies have been going there uh, i believe tesla has something near austin or yeah. in austin yeah tech exactly oriented. Sure. yeah yeah no yeah fully fully weather is fairly similar <laughs> yeah i went to austin so, yeah. one time and it was like 20 degrees outside i'm like what is this yeah no for sure yeah yeah also yeah uh it would be it would be similar yeah 
and with like so so basically you're 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 helping drive the economy and finding people or small organizations that have a good idea have a good concept unfortunately uh when you need money there's not really a replacement for it so you need that capital in order to like make a hire or you know buy a piece of equipment to make your restaurant more efficient like um do you have like an example you could provide on a uh, company that you went into and helped help spark them up a little bit and help them be successful yeah. today so the, the, one of the key things is that uh, of what we're doing is rbf right revenue based financing which is basically our ability to assess uh a business uh, based on the revenue streams that the predictable revenue streams of that company, right? So we're therefore there's two things, right? One, we need to have a lot of data so that we understand, uh, so that we have a good understanding of where the revenue is gonna go in the next like few months. Uh, I mean during during the maturity of the loan, and then two, it's uncollateralized, right? We're not asking for a guarantee or any kind of because we know that SMEs do not have uh, for do not have uh, for most of them they do not have any any kind of like large assets on the balance sheet. Um, so that's the problem we're solving. So, I mean, based on that, we've done quite a lot of, so for example, one of the things like it was a, it was a poke shop, right? So they, they, the, the business is working quite well, but they were missing some of the facility for them to open a second restaurant and they were doing a killing on the, you know, Uber Eats and some of these platforms. So we knew that it would be a home run and it was. Right, but they, so see, like we really like sped, uh, sped up the, you know, the, the, the development of that. Uh, two was on the solar panel, right? It was quite quite interesting because they were renting the panel, right? So they were it's a company that was building the panel and then renting out to others. So obviously there is a massive, you know, trade finance here facility. Uh, they're gonna recoup the investments. They have a lot, a very high predictability on revenue streams, but they need a lot of cash for them to grow, right? Otherwise, they just stop growing, right? So we did that uh, as well. So yeah, it really goes in multiple directions. And when you started started this organization, like were you just using your own money at, to get started? Did you find partners? Yeah. So the very beginning when we started the company, I used a little bit of my money and the you know my partner, um, uh, Karim was uh, who started this uh, with me. Uh, and then obviously we raised pretty quickly uh, pre seed funding, um, uh, so two point eight million dollars out of which we dedicated a big part of it for us to be able to prove the concept and being able to deploy. So we deployed more than the first, like uh, close to 2 million, we deployed it through our own capital. And then we managed to raise a debt facility along the way. How, how did you raise the money? Did you just have contacts? Did you have to knock on people's doors? Yeah. So uh, again, I think when I've done, it's my fourth company now. Uh, so I've, I have a lot of scars, a lot of VCs have told me no, and some of them have told me yes, but I've got some, yeah, obviously I don't, uh, like I have some contacts and so on, but at the end of the day, like it's what, what, what matters is what's happening in the pitch room, right? How you pitch the idea and how prepared you are. But yeah, so we managed to get uh, funded by, uh, two of the top VCs, FinTech VCs in Europe, uh, Daphne in France and Speed Invest in, um, uh, in, uh, Austria. So uh, yeah, and then and then we managed to uh, to grow the business a little bit, and we just raised our second round uh, about two months ago now. What what do you do to get your foot in the door? Like, do you cold call? Do you like show up to someone's office? Oh, anything, anything that works. Um, so <laughs> now, uh, and uh, yeah, I remember I talked. Uh, he was a big investor. I right? he was. Uh, uh, it was for SoftBank back in the days, but I managed. Uh, I was like, I stayed like twenty four hours in front of his office just to be able to have five minutes of his time, uh, and I, and I slept on his couch like literally in front of his office because I wanted I wanted his time. So anyway, so that's that's uh, that's one. But uh, no, like so you can obviously the best is to come recommended right warm warm Rico from other members of the you know other VCs and so on. Um, otherwise, honestly, like LinkedIn works really well for me. I don't know. I think, uh, I think it works for, should work for quite a lot of people. I think codes, but I think there is these aversions for codes. I think it's, if you're a first time entrepreneur, it's probably right. Uh, second time, third time, just go. Like, I think you're, everybody should be okay to talk to you, you know? Um, so I don't have that problem really. I think it's a, we, there's a lot of problems after that. Right. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, 
getting getting a foot in the door and getting the first meeting is not the most difficult, including on Sandy Road in the US. Yeah, for sure. So like you said this is your fourth fourth company. What's what's going on with the other three? <laughs> uh the first one was uh it was a group buying website that I did with a friend. It was quite very, very quick one. Um the second one was the biggest, obviously. Yeah. Uh, it was a company called Fetcher. It was in the e-commerce logistics space. Uh, just um, coming from a very simple, you know, understanding that half the world does not have addresses. It seems crazy in the US, right? Where you have, you know, uh, 26, you know, manor drive, uh, uh, 26, 24 manor drive, and then with the zip code, we don't have zip code. Half the world doesn't have zip code. Half the world doesn't have addresses. Um, and despite that, when you buy online, um, you're being asked for your address. So it's completely irrelevant uh, once you understand how packages are being delivered in emerging markets, which is basically through phone calls. The driver calls you and try to define where you are. So instead of that, we just, it would seem stupid and easy, but we went straight to GPS. So we deliver wherever you are. You could be at the beach, you could be at the restaurants, you can be wherever, right? People don't receive now necessarily the packages at home, right? They receive it everywhere, so we deliver wherever you are. Uh, and it went really well. So we went all the way to like 6,000 employees. We had operations across eight countries. Um, it became quite big. Yeah. Uh, so that was that's the company number two. Uh, and then I joined the Global. Don't know if you know Global. It's a food delivery app, very similar to Uber Eats or Deliveroo. We're present in 25 markets, and uh, number one in 23 of those. Uh, and we got acquired by Delivery Hero. Uh, that was about uh, two years ago now. Yeah. And then I switched then to move uh, to build company number four. With the company that got acquired, like, are you are, are you not involved in that anymore? No, 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 completely gone. Were you were you wanting to sell it? Was that the goal, or did it just kind of happen? It makes sense. I think as entrepreneurs, we always try to. I mean, not 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 always, but. I think we're dreaming of IPOs and so on. And I think a trade sale is very good. It's very, makes a lot of sense. Uh, we also, especially back then, uh, it's a very high winner takes all uh, type of market in the food delivery app. So it means if you're not number one or number two in one country, uh, it's going to be too costly uh, for you to stay in that market. So you need to be among the big boys. And there is only like two, three, four big boys, right? In the uh, in the world on the food delivery on the food delivery space, so we needed to be uh, one of them. And Delivery Hero was a partner with us, right? They were already on the cap table. They were already holding like thirty percent plus of the cap table. So it was making like tons of sense. Uh, and they've been amazing, honestly. Like pre post acquisitions, uh, great, great, great experience. Yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned. Like a lot of people want to go to like to market in terms of the stock market, like a via an initial public offering. Yeah. What a lot of people don't realize is companies such as Berkshire Hathaway, most of the companies they own are private. Private, yeah. So oh, that's right. like a big mis it's a big misconception that you need to be at the market ringing the bell. Yeah, I know exactly. I, I'm not saying it's bad, right? But it's uh, I think entrepreneurship carries its own uh, misconceptions and there's quite a lot, right? Whether we're talking about you know the image of the 25 years old university dropout that start a company and then and that becomes a billionaire is completely not the case, right? Like if you look at the the if you look at I always like uh, thought that it was interesting. Like there was a an article uh, saying like at what age so like the billion dollar company valuation, right? So the unicorns. At what age did the founder uh, found them? And the average is like 42, right? So we're not like the the like the top companies, the like the the unicorns, like the dream, pretty much, right? Even though now, uh, unicorn and billion dollar valuation, we we've learned that what does that mean? Anyway, but that's another uh, story. But like uh, su uh, the most successful businesses have been built on people that are like 40, 40 year old plus, uh, not necessarily have you know um, uh, a computer science degree, and not necessarily coming now from the valley, right? It becomes less and less true. A lot of the unicorns are coming from all over the U.S now big time and also all across the world. So yeah, it's changing. It's one of the mis misconceptions, like you said, right? So IPO represents a tiny percentage uh, of, of of businesses. Uh, so successful businesses and let alone businesses. Trade sales is, is a natural exit. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, the private market is uh, very big, and it's yeah. typically not on the news. So people people aren't listening to what's on the news. Exactly. Uh, with with that being said, uh, what's like twenty twenty four? What what's the big obstacle to overcome in twenty twenty four? Before I let you sign off. <laughs> Um, look, for me, I think, um, so the biggest challenge I would say that I see is interest rates. Obviously it's in everybody's head right now and what the Fed's going to do, but like you can see like how, uh, the Fed's decisions as, um, consequences on capital markets allocation all across the world. I'm talking about VCs being able to raise money for their own funds are also VCs deploying and also the arbitrage between, you know, like equity and and um, and um, and bonds i think the impact is massive so yeah I, I would say the biggest challenge uh for us personally would be like you know whether the high interest rate environment um is going to carry on for for a long time and then obviously there is all the macro right the macro events and what's going to happen from a macro perspective um so keep an eye on mm. yeah that's what i'm looking at too is Expecting a couple rate cuts, hopefully this year. Yeah, hopefully. Um, from the Federal Reserve, uh, would be nice to help push things forward a little bit with the economy, so we don't get too slow on some things. And if we get a couple rate cuts, you know, based on everything that I'm seeing and reading, it seems like the world's in a interesting spot. It's uh, it's like exciting to what a lot of people might compare to like the dot com age where. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the internet was starting to take the main stage. However, with like artificial intelligence, it's much different than what that was because, you know, for myself owning a business, just being able to use chat GPT, I'm so much more productive. Yeah, for sure. Now you look at that at scale across the globe, like how much more productive can any everyone be? And yeah. if everyone's more productive, that typically means people make more money you also save money because you don't have to hire people with the right things for you. Yeah. And I'm excited to see what that does to, uh, I guess what a, what economists would say is the, the production function. Yeah, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. And we don't know, right. We don't know how far and how fast it's going to be, right. This change. Um, so yeah. And I think our concepts, you know, like, because for a long time, right. If you look like since world war two and, you know, and even like the 19th century, there is always this correlation between like technology is giving us like better lives, right? Better lives, more comfort. And it's the first time where I think, I mean, at least that's my, uh, but it's not only my opinion, right? Uh, Ariri is like thinking the same. And, and anyway, so like it, it's, uh, there is, uh, this change is so big that it might change our relationship with work and our relation, how we even build our society because now work is not necessarily going to be the biggest uh, element of our life. Right? Because we're so productive now, we already reduced, uh, you know, working hours from a weekly basis by half since the 19th century. We're working half of what we used to work like 100 years ago. Like we understand that if we again half it, and with with technology, it probably is going to be more than half. Like we understand that it's going to be impact about what we're going to do with all this free time, um, and or unemployment, right? Um, so I think it's going to redefine quite a lot of um, relationship. Totally. Idris, you're doing it all. Thanks for coming on the Unconventional (laughs) Money Moves podcast. We'll see everyone next time. Bye, everyone. Thanks a lot.